Hello, I am Franca Redivo, the Secondary Math Consultant at the Lester B. Pearson School Board. I have created this short video presentation in the hopes of helping you to build an understanding of the practice of conversion and moderation. This is a practice that MELS applies to courses with a uniform exam and can affect a student's final school mark, sometimes drastically. This presentation will be broken down into three sections. The first section will be to explain conversion, the first but optional step in the process. The second will be to explain moderation and why it is done. The third section will take you through six examples of how moderation can affect student marks. And finally, I will conclude by sharing some thoughts on what can be done to mitigate the effects of moderation on school marks and avoid the big and often unpleasant surprises like the ones that occurred in July 2012 for many students. Conversion is a procedure done to a uniform exam. It is done when there appears to be an anomaly in the exam discovered only after the students have written it. It results in an increase in the exam marks for almost all students. It is done only on an exceptional basis. The reason for applying this procedure is to mitigate the negative effects of the anomaly. It generally reveals itself as a higher than usual failure rate. The procedure involves establishing a new pass mark for the exam and converting student marks accordingly. Let's look at an example of how this might work. Let's say that the failure rates observed over the last three years have been 28%, 30%, 32%, and then suddenly, boom, the failure rate is 40%. This looks anomalous. The average of the past observed failure rates is calculated to 30%, and we see that there is significant difference. Conversion does not affect all marks equally. The marks around the passing mark are affected more than the very high or the very low marks. I will show you the actual effect of conversion on the June 2012 CST4 math exam. What this chart shows is by how much a certain CST4 mark was increased as a result of conversion. A mark of 45% increased by 8 percentage points, giving a converted mark of 53%. A mark of 52% increased by 14, giving a converted mark of 66%, and in doing so becoming a passing mark, and a mark of 76% would increase only by 2, giving a converted mark of 78%. Marks greater than 80 were not converted. Apparently the new pass mark became 51 because it had an increase of 9, giving a converted mark of 60%. Feel free to pause this video at any time so you can take a closer look at numbers that I'm showing you. And for your information, of the 12 uniform exams written in June and the 12 written in August, 8 were converted. This is higher than usual, but this is what it was for 2012. Before we move on to the notion of moderation, I'll remind you that from this point on, when we talk about an exam mark or a MELS mark, if conversion has been done to the exam, it will be the converted mark that we are talking about. Conversion is applied on an exceptional basis. It affects only the exam mark. Exam marks will either go up or stay the same. They will not go down. Moderation, on the other hand, is applied throughout the system to every grouping of students writing a uniform exam, and it affects them all differently. It affects only the school mark, and it affects virtually all school marks, increasing some, decreasing others, but leaving some the same. Moderation is done to try to mitigate the variances in school marks across groupings caused by certain local variables. These variables can include the degree of difficulty of local assessments, how teachers arrive at their class marks, rewarding effort or behavior rather than achievement, how well the content taught matches the program and therefore the exam, how homogeneous or heterogeneous a group is, and for a homogeneous group, is it a strong or a weak class. Moderation involves changing the school marks of a group of students to reflect their performance on the uniform exam. The actual calculation uses the class average and standard deviations of both the school marks and the exam marks. Examples will be coming up shortly, but first a quick refresher or lesson on what a normal frequency distribution or bell curve looks like. It is this curve that is the statistical basis for the calculation that changes the student's marks. You will see lots of them in two colors before this presentation is over. Let me draw your attention to some features of this curve. You will see that it is symmetrical about the average. You will see that the curve is divided into three sections on either side of the average. Those are the standard deviations. The percentage indicated in each section is the percentage of data points, in our case student marks, that would fall into that section. 68% of the marks are expected to fall within one standard deviation of the average. 34% one standard deviation below the average, and 34% above the average. 
Feel free to pause here to absorb these observations before continuing on to an actual calculation. Okay, here's the calculation. Let me talk you through it. An example with basic numbers will follow shortly, but the main steps in determining a student's mark are these. First, determine how far away the student's school mark is from the school class average. Then express that in terms of the number of standard deviations of the school class mark that it is. Multiply that result by the exam standard deviation. Then once you have that result, you add that to the exam average, and voila, you have the student's moderated school mark. Okay, now for a couple of examples. But again, feel free to pause the presentation if you wish to mull this equation over. What we have here is an example of group data for one class. We have the school mark average of 70 with a standard deviation of 10. Going back to the original bell curve, that suggests that 68% of the students had a school mark between 60 and 80. Note the scale on the horizontal axis. Likewise, we have an exam average of 65 and a standard deviation of the exam marks of 15, suggesting 68% of the students got between 50 and 80. So while the curves look the same, the horizontal scale is different. But if we do express these two curves on the same graph and with the same scale on the axes, they would look like this. Let's look at a couple of examples of student marks. This student has a mark of 80, which is one standard deviation above the average. 70 plus 10 is 80. If we take the exam average of 65 and add one standard deviation to that average, we get a mark of 80. 65 plus 15 is 80. In this case, the student's school mark wouldn't actually change. This student has a mark of 60, which is one standard deviation below the average. If we take the exam average of 65 and subtract one standard deviation from that average, we get a mark of 50. In this case, the student's school mark would decrease. Okay, now for some examples of how this procedure affects class marks. Let's take a minute to look at the charts that MELS will pass on to school board's evaluation people. Note that this is actual data for a CST4 class that wrote the exam in June 2012. Each group is identified, along with the number of students in that group. The raw school mark average and standard deviation are given for each group. The converted exam mark average and standard deviation are given for each group. These two percentages are generally 100, but can be less. This has to do with the percentage of students used in the respective calculations. For example, if there were absent students, the percentage wouldn't be 100. And these numbers won't be addressed in this presentation. It has something to do with CGEP, I believe. And finally, they present a table to see the change in a student mark resulting from moderation. So the raw mark is the column on the left, and the new moderated mark is the column on the right. If we take the four main pieces of data, the average and standard deviation for both the school marks and the exam marks, we can create two bell curves that provide a visual representation of the data in the table. I would guess that you can see much more quickly by looking at the curves, rather than the table, that moderation had very little effect on this grouping. But let's look at some detail. If we compare the two averages, we see that they are very similar. We also see that the average mark of 54 gets moderated to the exam average of 52. It's a straightforward change, and you will notice that throughout these tables that the average of the school mark becomes the average of the exam. We see that the standard deviation of the two sets of marks is also quite similar. If we look at data points that are one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean or average, we see that those marks also changed very little. The message here is that if the set of class marks is similar to the set of exam marks in terms of average and standard deviation, there will be little change in the student's school marks. In this example, notice how the two curves have changed in relation to each other. They are still basically the same shape, suggesting a similar standard deviation, but the pink curve, the exam data, is to the left of the blue curve, or the school data. The school average was significantly higher than the exam average for this group. Not good news for student school marks. When we look at the standard deviation for the two sets of marks, we can see the actual effect on the student marks. Every single student had their school mark go down. For this group, again, the shape, and therefore the distribution, is similar, but this time the pink curve is slightly to the right of the blue, indicating that the exam average was actually higher than the school average. While it isn't a significant increase, it is enough to raise students' school marks. If we look at the marks that are one standard deviation below and above the average, we see that both are higher. This is because the standard deviation is very similar. Every single student would have their school marks moderated up. Here is a group that had virtually identical averages for the two sets of data. But you can see that the pink curve is taller and skinnier than the blue. 
This suggests that the standard deviation was smaller for the exam data than the school mark data. Remember that this suggests that the exam marks were dispersed less around the average. The group was a little more homogeneous for the exam than it was for the school marks. But the interesting effect of the skinnier exam data is that students with lower class marks will see their marks go up, whereas the students with higher exam marks will see their marks go down. Not by much, but still. In this example, you can again see that the averages are quite similar since the curves are symmetrical along the same vertical line, approximately. You can also see that the pink curve is much wider, suggesting a larger standard deviation or greater dispersion for the exam data. Here you see that the data supports that initial observation and a mark around the average doesn't change much. But if you look at the marks one standard deviation below and above the average, you will notice that the low marks get lower and the high marks get higher. That'll make some students happy, but not all. Our second to last example shows what can happen when neither the average nor the standard deviation are similar. In this case, no one is happy. I won't comment further on this one, but let you look at it for a bit. Pause if you like. While ideally, to avoid surprises, it is best if school mark data matches exam mark data. But if it doesn't, this is probably the happiest of surprises for all the students in the group. The exam average is significantly higher, and the standard deviation is lower. We see that all the marks have gone up, but the lower marks have gone up more. While this last example is a happy one, it doesn't account for how students may have been feeling with their low marks throughout the year. In conclusion, I will suggest some factors that can result in moderation having a significant effect on students' school marks. As the number of students making up the groups gets smaller, the potential for significant changes increases because each student's mark has a greater impact on the average and standard deviation for the group. This is generally an administrative decision and can't be addressed by the teachers. Inconsistency in student performance between classwork and the exam can cause significant effects both in the class averages and the standard deviations. On the whole, if students rely too much on their teacher for encouragement or scaffolding, they may give up more easily on the exam. If all students do this, the class average will be lower on the exam than for school marks. If only some students do this, the standard deviation will be higher on the exam than for the school marks. And you've now seen the effects of both these phenomena. The message here is to be a little less helpful, perhaps, at times, and to encourage student independence. Also, if teachers keep the standard deviation artificially low by not discriminating real differences in achievement among students, the standard deviation of exam marks will tend to be greater. The message here is continually monitor student progress and be realistic with the students. The uncharacteristic or unexpected result from one or two students also can have an impact when it comes to moderation. For example, exam anxiety may prevent a student from revealing what he or she understands, or, for one reason or another, a student has not performed well throughout the year, but has managed to pull it all together for the exam. This is something beyond the teacher's control, though those kind words of encouragement exam time may help. Another factor that can lead to significant moderation is a difference between school assessments and the exam. The level of difficulty differs. Challenge students with difficult questions throughout the year and give them the time to work them out. The severity of the marking may differ, or the criteria may differ. Assessments throughout the year should be evaluated using the evaluation criteria as outlined in the QEP and incorporated into the marking guides of the exams. And lastly, the format of the exam differs from what students are used to. Throughout the year, make sure that students are exposed to the type of assessment questions that are on the exam. That may even include direct instruction on strategies for answering multiple choice questions. Another factor to consider or question to ask is whether marks are being given for non-achievement related observations. Are marks given for effort? Are marks given for homework being completed? Are marks deducted for late assignments? If the answer to these questions is yes, it suggests marks are being used as a reward for behavior rather than as an honest reflection of what the student knows and can do in terms of the subject area. This can backfire under moderation if the behavior doesn't lead to the learning of the subject. And one last factor that needs to be considered, though one that is perhaps not suspected, is that the coursework throughout the year does not actually reflect the program that is evaluated through the uniform exam. So that's it for now, and I hope you've found this presentation helpful. I realize the pace was quick, but with this wonderful technology we have, you can watch and listen and pause again and again and again. Thank you.